Welcome to this week's Beers and Bites session with our co-hosts, Chris Jordan of Fluency Security and Jeremy Murdashaw from Fortify 24-7. This week's special guest is Mark Petrie, who is the Security and Compliance Manager at Event Corps. Director now, just got promoted. Oh, that's a congratulations, Mark. Uh, we'll be glad to hear, Chris, it was a zero dollar promotion. With <laughs> 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 like that, uh, before we get started with, with uh, introductions and stuff, Chris, if you can start us off with what beer you've brought today. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back. I'm going to bring up an oldie in this neck of the woods. This is a duck pin out of Baltimore. Uh, duck pin bowling, by the way, is one of the official sports of Maryland. The other one, of course, being jousting. Uh, duck pin is a lot safer. Um, so that's the first one. It's, this, this is a nice light beer. And then my backup, which, of course, we always wind up drinking the backup. Uh, this is from Banish. This is Ghost Fleet. It's a nice uh, New England-style uh, pale ale. And so it's, it's it's probably one of the better ones out of uh, out of Loudon. Loudon, of course, being uh, one of the brew capitals of the world. Um, so so I'm excited about this. All right, Jeremy. Now Jeremy just had that root canal, so I take it you're going to be doing 40 proof uh, beers. No, no, no. <laughs> Actually, I'm going the other direction this time. <clears throat> I've decided that I went back and I watched episode one, and I and I, and now I've watched episode 15 again, and I realize I've put on a little beer weight. So to try to counteract that, what I have found is a couple of interesting low calorie IPA options. Okay. <laughs> this isn't your, your, your mama's light beer kind of thing. So what we have, our first one here is a, it's called Flyjack from Firestone. Yeah. I remember that. that you like that one. I love it. Actually, it's become my, my daily cocktail, right? Because I don't feel guilty about drinking it. And the second one I have is from, again, another, from another California brewery. They like to put the labels upside down from Stone there in Escondido. It's called the Delicious IPA. Now, is it upside down? So they were drinking it while they're yeah. So you can it? you so. can you can see the label while you're drinking oh. it. So the uh, the idea is that these are gluten reduced, seven point seven percent alcohol still. So you still get a nice kick from it, but you don't get all the calories and the bloat. So so this, this is just a one week thing for you, Jeremy. Then. Well, 24 hours. <laughs> All right. So, Mark, what did you bring us this evening to see what you're drinking? Uh, well, I could get the bottle, but I'll just tell you, I'm drink I'm I'm the nonconformist here. I'm drinking a, a, a California Red. I guess it's a Cabernet. It's um, uh, called Pure Paso, P-A-S-O, from Paso Robles, which is Central California. Uh, and I like it, as I said to Chris before, because I've ridden my bike past the past the winery uh, on a bike trip in uh, on a sunny, warm day in Central California. Nice. Yeah, I know Paso Robles, and they're not too far from the coast, though, aren't they? About 40 miles from the coast, 30, 40 miles inland from uh, Cambria, which is the last place north of Los Angeles before before Hearst, it's by Hearst Castle, right? And yeah, and that was always a stop off point uh, for us when right. we traveled in California, but. I was thinking for a, a cab type grape, wouldn't you want a little bit more inland to be drier, like from Sonoma County? Oh, well, Sonoma County is quite a bit further north. Paso is pretty dry. Okay. Uh, Paso wines are very uh, fruit forward, um, and that may be a result of the warm climate, but, um, you know, they have a huge, uh, a huge wine industry there. And it's kind of what Napa used to be 25, 30 years ago, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it, it's it's a nice part of the world. All right. Well, for this evening, I'm staying with Alaska like I had last week, but it's some type of different one. It's called the Alaskan White. I'm not familiar with it. Uh, oh, it's a white ale. Okay. But it's be good. An ale, and it's like 5.3%. Uh, so we'll definitely give that a, a shot and see how it does. All right. Cheers, well, gentlemen. Cheers. Sure. So with that, uh, Mark, if now that you're a director, uh, tell us a little bit of course. <laughs> your background and if you will, you know, how you got into cybersecurity, what a lot of your experience is centered around. Okay. Um, I'll try and keep it, I'll try and keep it short. Um, so uh, like yourself, I was in the Navy for a number of years. Uh, I worked in the aerospace industry uh, about 1990. Uh, I lived in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, 
Um, I've worked for several of the big tech companies like Intel and Microsoft. Uh, I've been involved in a startup that got an exit, which did me well. Uh, I live on um, Bainbridge Island, which is a, a small island in the harbor in the uh, in the Puget Sound that's served by a ferry boat coming from Seattle. And uh, like Chris and like you, I live in a very rural, quiet area with trees and deer and raccoons and animals around. So I'm pretty much out in sticks, end of a dirt road. I got into cybersecurity because at Microsoft, um, I had really the coolest job in the, in the company in about 2010. Um, I was responsible for giving uh, uh, very high profile visitors to the executive briefing centers a look at the inside of our uh, cloud data centers, which were at that time just being used as the startup foundation for services that are called Office 365 and Azure. And these are phenomenal uh, uh, investments in technology, phenomenal services, uh, world-class facilities. And I took um, customers from companies like Volkswagen of Germany and uh, Coca-Cola and Toyota of Japan and uh, Foxconn of China that like the CEOs or the uh, VP of security inside those facilities. So in 2013, I was doing a briefing um, for a group that I was the next day going to take to Microsoft's uh, big data center in uh, Ashburn. And uh, my customer is one of the government three letter agencies. And uh, the CIO was there and the security folks were there and a bunch of and so, and this was in, we were in Crystal City. We were doing the pre-briefing at the Microsoft sales office there. Real nice, you know, glass walls and big screens and all that. And somebody walked in with a newspaper, Washington Post, and the headline said, Snowden reveals all. <laughs> and a big part of our pitch up to that time was um, how we could run um, customer workloads on shared infrastructure without security concerns, right? Yeah. So that conversation went downhill very fast. Um, and so uh, I initiated then after that a uh, crash program in our executive briefing center to develop fully the security and compliance uh, talk track and topics and show how we map different compliance standards to different products depending on the customer agency and so forth, okay? So uh, when I left Microsoft after I got really tired of traveling, going from Dubai to Singapore to wherever, you know, one, one week on, one week off. And I uh, went to work for a major telco selling security services, uh, fire, managed firewalls, penetration testing, uh, CMs and stuff like that. And uh, then came to EventCore and here we are. Um, we're a small company, uh, under 100 people. We're in the event services industry. And so we do about 60% of our business with Microsoft. And um, uh, we provide uh, conference registration and content delivery solutions to that industry. Now, you would have thought that that industry went off a cliff in March when the COVID hit. But guess what? Uh, pivot to virtual. So our developers went to work. And so uh, we now have a branded client that can deliver video and audio content it rides on top of the team's um transport right but it's branded for the event it's got content push you can see the speaker it has some uh, uh chat features in it and so forth so we've actually built a pretty nice business in delivering virtual event services and the other interesting thing is that we are now in the position of supporting uh events where we have a hundred thousand or more people Online. Wow, which is that's impressive. That, yeah, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> so I was going to ask you, and it seems like it's a no-brainer. Um, COVID's over. These virtual events are for real. I, I think that the industry will continue to be a mix of virtual and some on-prem, some physical uh, locations um, for the foreseeable future, just because travel budgets and, you know, I mean, yeah, people want to go to Las Vegas or San Francisco or, or someplace and spend yeah. $4,000 worth of travel and it, hotels and stuff like that. But that's not that business isn't coming back for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the good news is that um, companies like our customers, Microsoft and Oracle and some others, 
they can maintain a close touch with their customer base um, in a and build shared communities uh, completely online. And and we Eventbor offer a, a differentiated service uh, to that industry. So so Morgan, as you're talking, and what is the security concerns of all this? Because like in my brain, I'm just a regular information security person. I'm just thinking. Oh, people register and protect their privacies. Obviously, you're dealing with the most complex because you just built it, right? And developers are notoriously bad programmers, right? When it comes to security, right? So what, oh my God, how much, what, what is, what's going on in that crazy world of security when you went from zero to 100,000 people? Right. So uh, there was a case three, four years ago, and I believe it was the uh, DEF CON uh, conference where the event website in the co- in the hall, you know, in the at a Moscone Center yeah. in San Francisco, uh, got hacked. Oh, that'd be RSA then, yeah. <laughs> uh, that'd be RSA. All right, maybe it's RSA. Yeah, and um, it, it's just uh, it would be it would be um, like you're you're offering up this thing to conference attendees here. Play with this, you know, see if you can break it. Um, our particular architecture is pretty cool. It is serverless. Uh, there's no uh, virtual machines, no memory, no um, no server operating system. It's all containerized. Uh, we only work interact with API calls. We have SQL in the background. It's deployed in Azure. It's geo diverse, um, and we can load balance across geographies or fail over to an alternate if we have to. It's pretty pretty tough little thing. It'd be hard to hack, um, although there are some vulnerabilities. Um, what, what, what Fluency does for us is it lets our uh, security team uh, focus on those risks that have the highest potential impact um, and feel comfortable in ignoring or not looking at um, the ones that are routine or that are just noise. Right, and that goes back to that signal to noise discussion. Right. Um, the, in the in the future, what I'm trying to push for is uh, when we deploy a uh, service to a to a customer, and we we have a template, you know, that we use a main code branch, and then we skin it and customize it and stuff, and it's got workflow rules in it. Uh, I want to be able to do a um, a one shot, very fast. Uh, pen test on it just to make sure mm. that we haven't missed anything, right? And I'm looking for that service today. Uh, and it'd be low cost. Everybody wants to sell you an enterprise pen test for 30000 bucks, and I can get those all day long, right? So are you using containers? Yeah. I mean, you're, yeah, so, so, so a container, every container is its own. If you get a patch, it is a brand new container. Uh, you bring up a really interesting concept. I mean, obviously... The four people that listen to this, maybe one of them decided to write a company on this. But, but I think it's an interesting idea is to be able to pen test a container and track a container, right, against its ID and stuff like that. And, and if the way I look at it, obviously, I'm looking at dynamic binding and how to track uh, its usage as it's being used. But, but you know, and, and Jeremy, you you recently started looking at a different way of doing pen testing by passively analyzing data, right? You the cyber health check. Um, which That's I think right. we talked about in episode one of all weird things. Long so, time ago. so, so when you hear him talk about doing a pen test in an automated fashion, what are you thinking? <clears throat> I'm thinking, how do I, if you don't have any exposed, you have to have an exposed IP, right? That's probably yes. my only way yes. in, right? So I've got to figure out what from, uh, what I can see from that IP that I can then pivot. So I would probably have to, I probably have more of an opportunity to figure out what's going on behind the sheets if I'm in, uh, joined into one of the conferences and I have an enable a way to sniff the data streams and then see the communication, the API calls back and forth, things like that, right? That's exactly so right. To, That's exactly yeah. right. And hardening the API calls, nobody's doing that. Right. I mean, right. Less wow, that's a, keys and stuff like that. But. That's a very interesting concept, though, yeah. of parting API calls. I agree with you 100% that most people don't comprehend APIs correctly. Um, no, Jeremy, would you cheat a little and would you put it, an agent on the inside and saying these are the open ports, these are the open processes, 
would you would you try to cheat considering that your objective is security at the end or would you continue to down the road of of external pen test mentality so in a serverless architecture where do you put an agent you can't there's, right? no, there, there's no there's no operating system to load it into so you've so really got you build it into the into the container but i see what you're saying you're not you, really it's wait, not like a thin client or something like that. right like, it's so, not it's so, not a, a fat container as we would say so it's it's really about understanding the vulnerabilities and the exposed IP. And then once you join the conference, what communication channels am I able to exploit during that period of time where the where the where the, the conference is active? Right. Um, and then you know trying to trying to harden that. I mean, it's there's basically brokers, right? Like Apogee and some of those other types of tools out there that can do some of that. Would you think orchestration? You know, I'm, I'm going off in this bizarre world because i'm interested in this conversation deeply is obviously in my days we would fuzz it right we would we would passively listen to the api fuzz the different fields and jason's going to be beautiful because i can i know the fields i can fuzz do you think ai and machine learning could help with the fuzzing techniques of what we're talking about yeah yeah and i I think Uh, it can help with the velocity I'm gonna to have to get that Irish whiskey real soon. I'm, this this was too quick, and it didn't it, it didn't fight me. It, this is this is this was water. I hate to tell you the duck. This is basically a above Budweiser, but it's not my fancy quality. A, a I've fancy had five more to go through. Yeah, fancy so, Budweiser. So Mark, is pretty uh, good. Mark, as you look at your day to day activity, right? Obviously, with a, a company that does marketing and events and things, your people are probably going all over the place. Um, and trying to formalize getting SOC 2 compliance ready and stuff. What are some of the biggest challenges that you're finding with that whole process? Yeah, yeah, great question. So um, I do believe that the best and highest purpose of achieving any compliance standard is sure getting the logo so you can use that as a sales and sales aid, right? That's important because it obviates uh, customer questions. If we can say that we're PCI or SOC 2 or ISO, and we're, we're in some stage of all of those, that's all great. But to me, the biggest single benefit and the reason we're doing this is to make ourselves better as a company in terms of being able to establish customer trust in how we handle mm-hmm. their data. Um, and we, we do handle some customer, some payment information, you know, credit, credit cards and stuff like that. Um, so it's all about trust. It's all about trust. And if I can say that I'm SOC 2, I have a SOC 2 assessment in place with no findings, or I can say I have completed a 27,001 compliance audit, right? That's That's great stuff. But the real benefit is what has been the implication for that on the organization, how it does business. Um, so my job is not only to submit the evidence and get the audit done, but to drive the changes into the organization in terms of our incident management, um, our remuneration or mitigation of security related issues, feeding those back into our policies with, with a root cause and corrective action, and then documenting that. So one of the great things that Fluency did for me, right, and for Tim is Hey, we can just spit out that damn report that says, show me all issues of greater than uh, severity level 4,000. And um, we have a mitigate, we have a record that they've been viewed and acknowledged and closed. And to some extent, what the investigation was. Yeah. And I think that using, uh, Tim is using uh, the pager duty tie in that we've put into the tool. And Alerting I think- and alarming. I think that helps yeah. make it a whole lot easier with that whole audit process too. It does. It, it without a doubt it do, well. It certainly helps with the alerting and alarming. Uh, in terms of in terms of, of uh, in terms of auditing, my what I do is I generate and submit evidence, and the best evidence has is high quality. In other words, the, the, we have we have hundreds of controls. A control is a requirement. Got to have a password, right? So the response on that control is we have a 12 character minimum and it's got to be random and it's got to have special characters in it. It's renewed every night, whatever it is, right? 
that's a control. Um, if the control says that um, we investigate and mitigate all security issues, uh, you know, of severity equals high, let's just say, or medium or high, um, being able to spit that report out of out of fluency is very helpful because it means I don't have to leak through go, go through a bunch of emails and crap like that. So that's the real benefit of a tool like Fluence. Um, uh, you, you blow me away, Mark. You, you just went over two different concepts that are, I don't expect out of the West Coast. I hate to say that, right? The first right. one is your ability to translate value and security to customer trust, right? That's something that Al just actually wrote something about that like a month ago as we were going after SMBs and dentists and talking about, that's a, that's a very insightful jump in a, in, a, in a conversation like this. I think that that trust is a, it's critical in, in our industry, but it's something that people don't really think to try to actually justify, right? To, 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 to do. And then the other one that you did a big jump on was this, I say it all the time, is evidence, right? So when you're sitting there from governance and you're talking about governance and you're saying, I'm governing this. And, and, and I'll tell you that the downfall of Western civilization will be called the CISSP. And that's because it became a checklist and, 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 and the people didn't understand how actually security worked, right? And this idea that, listen, I have to see that the requirements actually implemented. And I, if I can find evidence, right? And we talk evidence all the time, right, Jeremy? It, it really goes back to, again, uh, doing cyber health checking is to, to validate that something occurred. Yep. I mean, that's, that's a mind, Mark, you say so casually. I'm like writing this shit down going, oh my God, this is. <laughs> well, you're, 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 you're driving his marketing plan now. You yeah, really are. Like, I, I, I think it's excellent. I, I think that you have very you good. Pulled yourself out there. You pulled yourself out there, Chris, because I'm a CISSP and I damn near hung up. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, so all the other guys go like that, Mark. <laughs> no, I, I, I think the CISSP is evil. Yeah, and you know, and the reason why, listen, the CISSP, God bless everybody who, who took it, um, doesn't yeah. really justify the quality and the thought. Of a right. real good security. It person. is exactly like uh, it's exactly like teaching to the test in uh, in uh, high school. You know. Yeah, just, yeah. You 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 have to learn this verbiage that you don't even you know what it is, and then someone comes back and says, "No, that's a that's not a light bulb. That is a luminescent system." Oh God, a luminescent system, right? Yeah. And, and, and the foundation by which they can build a bond with real experience. But but it does allow communication from one one person to another. But but I, what I, the reason why I, I belittle it, and I do, I mean, I remember talking to Mudge, and Mudge and I said, we will never get that. I and, get it, uh, I get it, I get yeah. it. But, 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 but you, you go back to your answers, right? And you go back to what you were just talking about. This is not under CISSP. We don't talk about you know, the structure of how security works and the resulting structure. Listen, we will, of course we want security, but it's not going to happen if people don't have trust. Right. Yeah, that's a fact. Well, so I, I don't know about you, but I learned that lesson a long time ago when I caught a financial advisor churning my account. Um, <laughs> yeah, you don't. <laughs> but 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 trust is a big one. And then you brought up like, I mean, I I, I, I feel like we could do almost a I don't want to call it a history report because it makes us feel all old. But you you began talking about the early days of Office 365 and moving from a data center, and then Microsoft all of a sudden started adding these services. And, and we argue all the time in-house on our side between Microsoft's universe and AWS's universe. And, and I'm very comfortable in the AWS because it's a dry techie world, right? Where Microsoft has very complicated integrations, tons of product inside their cloud. It is, it is the difference between C and .NET. I hate to say it, right? If you're a coder, you know exactly what I'm saying. C is simple. There's here's all the reserved words. I get it. Dot net. I'm just adding a dot to the end of a variable, and, and, and I'm making this crap up as I go along, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so here's an here's another interesting distinction. And so um, I live in this city called Seattle, where both of those products are native to our area, right? And I know people. I 
I did a consulting gig at Amazon in the 2014 timeframe. Uh, I bought their stock and I wrote it to, you know, from like 300 to 500 and got out. So, wow, I doubled my money, you know, now look. But um, here's an interesting thing about, here's an interesting thing about uh, uh, Microsoft versus Amazon. And it goes back to the concept of um, de de delivering a product on a CD or a DVD that was physical and went out to a customer. And then, of course, you hot fixed it, right, uh, when it got installed. So Microsoft, even now, releases a, a new product in the 365 world when, let's just say, they've got 85 to 90% of the SEV1 bugs fixed. Amazon's threshold is much lower, mm. much mm. lower. They will put stuff out there that's got obvious holes in it. And they figure that the early adopters who use the product in the first six months, they'll either find those and we'll fix them or we'll, um, they'll find new ones. And, uh, and so we'll move into version two. I like the Amazon philosophy, which is, you know, deploy early, uh, either fail small or uh, don't, don't wait for, deploy the minimum, the minimum viable product. I think that's a great mm. philosophy. But I think we also have to think about, would we bet our business on something like that? In other words, Sure, for a desktop widget or something, fine, but I'm not going to take my SQL back end or something down low in the protocol stack and have it deployed with a bunch of, you know, critical bugs in it because you could have all kinds. Does this make sense? So it makes perfect sense. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's one of those things that's it's in the security world, we always consider the issue of business versus security, right? And, and you brought it up as a different way, which I've never really thought about. You know, most part, you have to understand being East Coast, we got a lot of government. You brought three. Wait, I'm gonna, I want to dig into this East Coast thing. Uh, I'm an yeah. East Coast guy. I'm Naval Academy and Johns Hopkins. Uh, so I grew up on the East Coast. Um, uh, but it, but my dad moved our family out to California in the 60s. So, so East Coast, West Coast. So security philosophy. Well, we had this discussion in the Navy, too. You know, were you East, yeah. Coast, East Coast fleet or West Coast? East Coast, Coast West Coast. There is a huge difference in security. That's one reason why I like Jeremy being on these things, even though he's like, he's like the the guy. He's like Doug and Doug in the, the that old, right? He he chimes in when he when he he actually has a thought. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's more it, it, this East caught. Coast West Coast is like Tupac and Biggie, right? Come on. Well, <laughs> the East Coast East Coast has a very um, NSA kind of way through security, sure. right? In God we trust, and everybody else we monitor. Right. In the the West Coast, rigor has is a rigor, and it's also I would I would almost call it a gunslinger kind of thing where where they look at the oh, business yes. and they develop the security around the business, and they yes. don't come up with these complicated models. Like right. you bring up a risk model, people in the West Coast are like I don't know what a risk model is. People on the East Coast, yeah, risk model, we got it. Yeah, right? right, opportunity, yeah. vulnerability, exactly. threat. Right. You, you guys are thinking about CMMC. And how do I achieve well, those types of things? That? So you're too that? modern. It's an acronym I don't know. What is that? Uh, cybersecurity maturity model for oh, okay. it's based, government. It's based off in this 800, uh, one, which is based off the 53, but 171 is the yeah. commercial. And, and, and this is a really interesting twist, right? So, so we, first of all, East Coast model, because it's based on the requirements of the government, they don't care about money. Government guys, they, they don't care. They'll just tax you more. In the West Coast, you have to make money, yes. right? You, Al's in the middle. He's in Texas. So he he's none of the above. They don't actually belong to the United States. Um, well, it's the Republic of Texas, if you want to know. <laughs> so, it's almost halfway in the middle. And I think I think in, in, in the modern world, um, we have to be comfortable assuming some risks consistent with either expenditure or cost. You can find tons of security people who are checking boxes and um, they're Dr. No. Um, there are some things that you, you, so my personal risk philosophy, and thank you for clarifying on the NIST 800 uh, 171, because uh, I forgot that particular. Um, so here's one of the things I'm trying to work on this year as we approach ISO 27001. So, so there's a section 14 in the uh, Annex A requirements, which is, Prove to us that your software development process takes into process. account security 
at, from a design standpoint? Are you resistant against fuzzing, field cramming, SQL injection, all that crap? Prove to us that you've tested that. Um, uh, prove to us you've taken the common vulnerability enumeration or the OWASP or the MITRE or whatever your threat model is or all of them into account as you built and deployed the product. And I'm not going to say we don't have a story to tell there, but coming up with evidence to prove that we do that and making a good case for it, that is, I'm betting my job that I can do that between now and when we start the audit. This is, this is a fascinating, you know, thing because in the, in the, um, in the government world, you just brought up we, in the old days in the rainbow series, right? In the 20, is, is you brought up what we call an A rated system, right? In, in other words, it's a proof. Let me just tell you that there weren't many A rated systems because you can't do what you just did. What you just said is, is literally, it's going to be a debate, not a reality. I yeah. hate to tell you that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's my problem with the, with, with the ISO because of the common criteria. The common criteria was based upon idealism, not reality. And you just brought up a great point about business and security, about the acceptance of risk. And, and if you look at the difference between AWS and Microsoft, there's risk differences. Sure there is. I, I think that was, listen, I, I'm writing this crap down. I normally don't write much down when we have these conversations, but I think that's a, a well, also because I'm drinking, I'm going to forget it. But the, I think it's a very important detail. Right, that 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 business really is. Listen, I mean, I used to say this all the time. People hate me when I tell you this story. I had this guy John Cronican, who used to work for this company called Marban, and now he started security, computer security in the 1960s. And John Cronican came up with this idea of confidentiality, integrity, availability. Yep. But he he would tell me, Chris, security is a leaky boat. It is a leaky. My boat. job, my job is to get you across that river. I really don't care how much water is in that boat. You get across that river, I did my job. That's a very business mentality just brought up, right? I've got AWS and Amazon, right? Or AWS and Microsoft. and Microsoft. Which one gets me across the river cheaper? Oh, Is AWS by far. By far. Yeah. But which one keeps the most water out of your boat? Really who depends. cares? It really depends on how you uh, configure sure. things because sure. either way you can go. You, you can get misled and, and and put too much trust in what these things are doing for you on your behalf without reading. Well, the that's a different story, right? So we have to deal with the, the, the as Marge used to call it, I can't believe I used his name twice in this thing, um, the snake oil salesman, right? We used to have t-shirts that say we just sell the snake oils, right? But, but you're bringing that interesting piece up. And I just think it's a, it, it, it's really hard in the business world to sit down with a, with a regular customer, right? And I'm not going to say you're not a regular customer, but a regular customer, I, I don't know. You, you you start talking this this thing about risk and they, they don't care. They, they, they got this piece of paper. I need to make these compliance. I need to make this jump. And it's like, you you care about the company and the security or you care about the compliance? And I know they should be the same thing, but sometimes they're, they're not. not. They are yeah. not. And also... If you, uh, when I did my risk enumeration, right, in my big spreadsheet, what I realized was that the majority of risks that the company had, um, and I think this is true for many companies, you're dealing with, especially when you have tools like fluency and the Palo Alto firewall and force tunnel. I mean, this stuff is really good now, mm -hmm. but you're still dealing with low probability, high impact events. So, uh, no matter how good your CM, your firewall, your your endpoint protection is, there's still a possibility that some dumbass, um, you know, second year intern is going to click on an email and brick every laptop in the company and all our data, and we'll never get it back, and we're out of business. That can happen. Um, that, that's a reality, Mark, and that's that's yeah. a message I try to convey because when they when customers that are new to this ask me, well, what is cybersecurity? Well, I'll say, well, let me ask you a question. If I locked up all of your computers all of a sudden and said, you got to pay me a huge amount of dollars to get your data back, if you get it back for one, uh, how does that affect your business? Can you yeah, what? Yeah, yeah. What is the reputational damage or the fact that that data has been, you know, uh, uh, 
harvested for credit cards or uh, yeah. well, in fact they're, they're taking the client data now that you're protecting yeah. on your systems and they're extorting those clients I know it. data I know it. But you, you gotta love listen you gotta respect the hacker you gotta love the pivot right we we shut down one one avenue of revenue, right? We we everyone's now doing backups. Now we've got backups local. We got backups in the cloud. We got backups of our backups of our backups. Fine. Now that we've got your data, now we're going to exploit you. We're going to publish your data. Now we're going to go. You got to love the pivot that they're doing. That's actually a good good insight. I wasn't going to go that route, but that's a well, very good insight. Well, the pivot has been from you know the 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 five to eight billion dollar industry that grew up hardening the edge with firewalls and you know trip wires and screening routers and access yep. control and all that shit and to now people yeah. people are the and and here's the motivator there are cities in countries like Romania and Belarus and stuff where Ferrari dealers have sprung up because the 24 year old kids who wrote the, the clever <laughs> code that got into solar winds for example they're they're getting paid a commission. Oh yeah, big time. Well, I was driving a new guys, do, do, I think I think the one thing that we have to recognize as a security industry is that the the attacker has its own development cycle. They have their own IT teams, they have their own farms of of developers who are working on the next best exploit. And they take advantage of things like the SolarWinds hack. They got Microsoft's code. You know, what are we going to do to protect Microsoft at this point? Right. That's where we're, you know, they've pivoted. Then they came in, they did this big data retrieval so they could continue evolving their tool set. And we as a security industry need to continuously evolve our tool set to keep up with their tools, techniques, tools, TTPs, right? And 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 fluency and and Sentinel One and these are all just tools out of, a, of an overall security strategy that organizations need to implement. Organizations like Event Core or any organization on the planet who's doing business, who has an online presence. If you're, if you're connected, you're at risk. Now, right? here's, the, here's the other thing that I often hear. Well, I got to figure out if I get cybersecurity insurance, how much can I save on not buying your stuff? Right. And the, and the problem is, is they don't understand that back in May of 2019, Trump did executive order 13873. And people can look it up. That's why I gave it to you, which basically expanded the definition of what the uh, reach of war exclusion meant. So if if you said a nation state did this attack and then most cyber insurance policies say nothing. Yeah, you get nothing. So like an act of God exclusion in a in a in a well, fire. well, and, and you and you have to be careful with that because OFAC is very much involved in those ransomware payments. And if if you all of a sudden are trying to get your data back and you don't know who the underlying threat actor belongs to, is it a nation state or is it just a bunch of script kiddies who got lucky, right? Yeah. If you, you end up yeah, paying yeah. Iran or you end up paying Russia or North Korea. You as the company and you as the person who wrote the check, criminal transaction. it's a criminal transaction and you're going to jail, right? Yeah. So if you do end up, if you're listening for our four, for our four audience members, maybe five now. Well, Dave Mayberry, we, I don't know if he's one of the four. But, he's here there. <laughs> but, but what you have to learn, yeah, what you have to understand is that if you do get ransomware, you need to immediately call, call, call the local authorities, you need to call the FBI, but you need to inform OFAC, which is a part of the Treasury Department. And let them know that you've got ransomware. And when it comes, when it all boils down to whether you have to make that pay or not pay decision, you need to make sure that they're involved in that. And they will recuse you of the decision to pay so long as you're, you've, you've gone through all the Notified. process and gone through all the hoops, right? Wow. It, but it's, a very important, it's a very important that people understand that. Yeah, and excellent, Jeremy. My point really is, you know, in this whole discussion of, of this cyber insurance, is that the C-suite tends to say, "Ah, it's a panacea as an offset for risk." And while it can help, you ask Moderna from years ago, who's still in court battles today, when their manufacturing got shut down, 
who's trying to battle with the insurance company. Or experience. Yeah, we're 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 gonna, you know, we're talking to an insurance group right now, Al, and uh, that is one of the issues, right? So the insurance company, they, you know, it's not like the Incredibles where they're trying to get out of paying, but the reality is, is that they gave you insurance. And they want to make sure you you held up to your part of the bargain. It's really difficult. It's so ill defined. And, and it's, it goes back to that trust, right? We we buy it because we want to give some assurance and trust to the work we do, right? right? But but it is an interesting issue because uh, it's a mess. I I, I I wrote a blog two years ago at RSA about the fact that I believe at this point here at RSA, because there were 600 product companies that didn't know what they were doing, that you're better off just buying an endpoint and spirit cyber insurance now. I think nowadays, maybe, you know, you're better off, you know, trying to defend yourself. But at that point there, you know, it's true that, that, that cyber insurance was as much of a legitimate answer only because so much vaporware and smoke occurs at RSA. Yeah. Um, but anyways, so one of the things, by the way, I, I think that you guys went over because, and I go back to that pivot thing, Jeremy, because I think it was brilliant. Um, we were talking about what I thought you were going to talk about, Mark, is that there was this issue around response, right? That everybody put everything in defense. And, and the cyber intelligence concept is prevent, prevent, prevent. But the reality is, Bruce Schneier would say it, I would say it, Belden would say it, is that eventually you lose and that the smart guy is betting on the loss. Because right. the loss is going to be much more damaging than the amount of money you spend on prevention. Yeah, that's a fact. So yeah. There, yeah. there was a philosophy that I like a lot, which is the assume breach philosophy. In other words, if you if you would, were to assume that you're you've already been hacked, what would you do to minimize the impact of that of that of that presumed mm -hmm. breach? And that goes to like, you know, sharding your data or uh, spin in your API codes every tw every 24 hours or every transaction, whatever. The other point I was going to bring up, and I realize we're running out of time, but we can go on for a long time. And I'm happy to come back and do this again. We, we always do this, Mark, so no worries. Yeah, yeah but, but yeah. But uh, the other thing I was going to bring up is um, the concept of a, um, a, of a tail chase. In other words, as long as we're in the countermeasures business, we're always behind the threat. We're reacting to the latest threat that we've seen. That always that will always be a losing battle. Sooner yeah. or later, the defenders will fail and the attackers will get in. Whether it's in breaching the ramparts in a, a in a military fortress, or whether it's in uh, competing program trading algorithms or air-to-air -air missile combat, it's the, the attackers will always get you eventually. Yeah, when you look at solar winds with Einstein, right? Einstein was supposed to be this panacea, and it had no clue. Yeah, well, we'll get into Einstein someday. We'll we'll get Parsons on the call one time. We'll bring them in. Um, you're talking about a Chinese finger trap. I mean, it's 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 That's... probably the the stupidest design in the universe and the best marketing early on. Um, you know, and by the way, Mark, we didn't even get into your you know, it went over my head at one point because I was going to go into this this whole for concepts um, that you were just talking about. But you said early on about the Naval Academy, right? Did you went to the Naval Academy? Yes. First of all, I feel sorry that you had to ever polish the deck of those wonderful sailboats. Those things are absolutely gorgeous. Oh, I loved my Navy 12. <laughs> Oh my God, the most beautiful boats in the universe. I got jealous every time I went in Annapolis and saw those suckers. I, I sailed in Annapolis a lot myself. Um, can you explain to, in one day we might actually have a young person listening to this. Yeah. Um, what the Naval Academy taught you that you still use today? Because the oh, Naval wow. Academy is, is, is a very tactical and strategic kind of education. That's different than, than a vocational education you get in, in the rest of the universe. Could, right. you, could you go over that? I mean, I, I just love the Naval Academy, and I think I'd like to hear your answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm thinking of a story, and I don't, and I, I can tell stories all day long, but I, I think that to distill it down, 
is um, as a leader, your support of, and if I may, love for your team, for they carry you, is a really important thing. Uh, I, I knew a guy, um, he, when he pulled up in his plane and he opened the canopy and he would throw his helmet down to the ground crew and say, God damn radar wouldn't lock up, you know, or broke lock, whatever. Right. And, um, it's a long story, but that guy's dead. Um, because he treated, he treated his team with disdain. So one is as a leader. Uh, and a decision maker, you have to be ultimately accountable and your uh, conduct and communication must be impeccable. One. Two, you have to you have to respect and love your team. Um, and um, I guess the third one would be uh, if you screw. Oh. Tenacity, make them tell you no. There you go. Make them. T- I love that. Make them tell you no. In other words, don't don't give up. If you believe something and you you're going to drive this and you're going to you know whatever it is, don't give up. Make them tell you no. There it is. Three bullets. Yeah, and I, it makes me think. Uh, now I didn't go to Annapolis, but the, my old man went to the Army o- uh, officers training, and and one of the things that they were well known for was. There is no excuse, sir. So it's about accountability, right? Yeah. And I think I, I can't imagine they, that wasn't part of uh, what you learned there as well. Yeah, yeah take your Sure. Your dad, your dad was a Mustang. He was an Army infantry. Did but he went from he went from E to O. Yes. He must he Mustang. He did. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Did you grow up in in uh, Georgia there, uh, Al, or, or in seven years in Fort Benning, years yeah. in Berlin? That's where it would have been. All over, and then I said enough of the army and yeah. went, went into the navy. You see where that got you? Yeah, that's, he was a rebellious son. <laughs> <laughs> and and I guess the uh, I guess the other thing that I that I have learned is that temper everything with a little bit of humor because that's the that's the the. Uh, that's the thing that keeps people engaged, you know. That's well, the- I think you know to kind of wrap it up because I, I, okay. I, like I said, I, I, we could go on forever, but we could. But I think Absolutely. that um, you're bringing up some interesting points because right now we we started this whole conversation with you becoming the director, and you know, we talk about leadership. Obviously, you have it. Um, you know, to kind of wrap it up is I mean, how do you feel? The role as a leader in cybersecurity, even in, and you call it a small business, but 100 people is not small. Is, is what do you think is the importance right now? How can you lead in today's world in cybersecurity? Yeah, especially when this topic is of interest to every business now because of high profile hacks and, yeah. uh, uh, right. Um, and uh, a, a, a cybersecurity leader has to be able to gently, you cannot be Dr. No. You cannot be Dr. No. Um, what you have, what I find that I have to do is really two things. One is gently influence and, 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 and speak in terms of, we can do that, but if you do, here is the risk or the exposure that opens up. Mm. So, you know, Ed? The, the other thing I was going to add, Mark, if you could talk to this, is I perceive an age gap, right, in this whole notion of being able to mentor young into a, a, a leadership experienced role. I see that being minimized or marginalized because I don't see enough youth coming into the business. Thoughts on that? Yeah, or they're or they're victim of the CISSP checkbox um, thing that that Chris alludes to. I think ethics ethics need to be. Listen, I mean, let's talk about the greatest generation, World War II. I mean, the generation before us taught us a lot, and and I just feel like the soul of the individual and responsibility to others has been replaced by a section of being a victim. I hate to say that. And that people say, what's in it for me when they show up to work and 
and they look at the clock and, and, and people are triggered because they're offended. They're offended because of how they feel, but I get it. But, but the, the reality of security is to protect somebody else, right? And you, I'm talking to two people that served, right? I mean, you, you didn't serve because you were protecting yourself. I mean, that's the one lesson that we all learn. Yeah. I'm, I'm taking it back. I, I agree that we struggle to mentor. I struggle to mentor. I, I thought I, because I understood that I need to mentor, that that answered the box. I, 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 I was going to F on it. I, I, <laughs> I, I fail sometimes. And that was not the F I was talking about. Right. Um, mentoring people, right? That, that, that I, I really want people to be a better person because I know being a better person is taking care of the person next to you, not yourself. True. One of the things that I believe very strongly about mentoring is the incredible value of praise and acknowledgement. For um, so, uh, for example, Al, on our calls, there's a young man named Matthew who yep. basically doesn't say much, right? Right. So let me tell you, um, he's a hell of a writer. He can communicate. He's a he's a fantastic writer. So I I basically asked him to, you know, would you prepare these evidence items? And he did it beautifully. And I I made sure to praise him. I did a stunning job. You know, you're a you're mm. a damn good writer. So the pra- the value of praise and acknowledgement and affirmation, uh, because what you what they what you must recognize is in their view it's coming from someone that who they respect and that magnifies the value. Of it. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that, right? Just because we have the white whiskers and stuff going here, Mark. Uh, you know, I, I know Chris and and, and Jeremy are going to catch. Mine grow out white. They did. They grow out white now. This, but, this is the my mom was very sad about that. But so, yeah, cool. so this, life, is great, this is Grecian formula right here. There you go. <laughs> so as you, as you look at aging, you sometimes run across these people who say, I know everything. I don't need to learn anything else. And I personally believe, and I think it's a part of a leadership role, that learning never stops. Loneliness, right? So you have to, con- have to have continuous learning in your life. For some reason, I talked about you, but okay. <laughs> Gentlemen, I really enjoyed it. I hope you have a nice evening. Thank you so much. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Mark. All right, All right, take care. Bless you. All right. Bye. Bye.